Our second gospel reading for today is also from Luke chapter 1, that passage that has come to be known as the Annunciation, in which Gabriel tells Mary that she is going to be the mother of the Lord. But in today's sermon, I want to ask the question, why? Why was Mary chosen among all possible applicants for that job? Why was she favored and fortunate and blessed among women? Is it possible that there was in her young life some characteristic or quality that could be cultivated in our own? Well, let's listen and find out as I read from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. In the lives of children, there is a season somewhere between preschool and high school when faith is at its strongest, when they can believe almost anything. It was during that time in my own life that I believed I could fly. I remember the day clearly. I was standing with my best friend, Bobby Thompson, on the front porch of the Gladeville Presbyterian Church in Wise, Virginia, where my father was the pastor. He was finishing up some work inside, and we were waiting outside for him to get finished so that he could drive us home. We had already waited a long time, and we were getting bored and restless. And then suddenly, without warning, my friend Bobby jumped off the porch. Now, it wasn't a high porch, only about five feet to the ground, but enough to cause that fluttering sensation in your stomach and to sting the bottoms of your feet when you landed. I know, because as soon as I made sure that Bobby hadn't broken any bones, I jumped. And then he jumped after me, and I jumped after him, and so on and so forth. We spent the next few minutes jumping off that porch just to pass the time. And then just to be different, I tried flapping my arms when I jumped. And as soon as I hit the ground, I knew that it had taken a split second longer for me to get there. And that my landing had been imperceptibly softer than the landing just before. I looked up at Bobby and said in a voice thick with wonder, Bobby, I can fly. And for the next 10 minutes, Bobby and I took turns flying off that porch, getting up a good running start and flapping our arms furiously as we sailed off the edge and bicycling our legs and claiming excitedly after each landing that that time, that time we had felt some lift. (laughs) Now anyone who was driving past the church and looking on this would have thought that we were idiots. Two boys flapping their arms, jumping off the porch, certain to be sore the next morning, which we were. But in our mind's eye, we were winging gracefully to the ground, 
every time, flying, not falling, and only one good effort away from rising up and away from that porch to bank left down Norton Road, turn right on Main Street, circle once or twice around the elementary school, and come back to land lightly in front of my amazed father. We believed that we could do it. And the next day at school, we told our friends that we had come this close, this close to flight. I was little back then. I was light. If a good wind had caught me in the right way, I might have lifted off the ground. But since then, I have grown older and heavier and hopelessly earthbound. I don't fly off porches anymore. Makes me sad in a way. Every once in a while I will look into the eyes of children and see there that shining something that makes them believe on the day when the wind is just right, when they can get up a running start, when gravity releases its stubborn grip for just a moment, they too will lift off the ground and soar above the earth like birds, like kites, like angels. But then things change. Years ago when my daughter Ellie was six, she came to me with the shocking news that her cousin Ashley no longer believed in magic. Seriously, I said. Yes, she said, somberly. She says it's not real. And the two of us had to sit down and shake our heads as if a close friend had died. How sad to think that a nine-year-old would forever close the door of that room called magic, a room in which she had played so happily for so much of her life, a room in which fairy godmothers can turn mice into horses and pumpkins into coaches, a room where anything, anything can happen. I imagined Ashley closing that door and locking it with a key, and then with a very grown-up look on her face, tossing that key out an open window and into the tall grass where she could never find it again and never again be tempted to enter that room. How sad to lose one's faith in magic and at such a tender age. For my part, I have tried to avoid it as long as possible. When I was in graduate school trying to write a 300-page doctoral dissertation, I had this regular daydream that one day while I was working, I would hear a knock on the door and get up and go and answer it, open the door and find an old man standing there, a messenger dressed in a gray flannel suit with a blue bow tie. And he would say to me, congratulations. And I would say, for what? And he would say, you, among all your peers, still believe in magic. Said for a while there you had some competition. Your old friend Bobby Thompson believed until just this morning. But this morning he gave it up, leaving you as the only one left among your peers who still believes. Congratulations. And I would say, well, thank you. What do I win? And he would look a little surprised as if I should have known this. Why? Three wishes, of course. And in those days, my first wish was always that my dissertation would be done so I could go out and play with the other kids. One day, Luke tells us, a messenger came knocking on Mary's door. And he came saying something like, congratulations. It's a wonderful story. But I have often wondered how Mary found favor with God. What was it she did? What was it she said that caused God to choose her out of the hundreds and possibly thousands of available virgins in first century Palestine? Is it possible that she, among her peers, was the only one who still believed? Because in those days, among God's people, there was a regular daydream that one day, 
one day God would remember his promise to David and put one of his ancestors on the royal throne who would rule over Israel forever, who would restore it to its former glory and inaugurate a new age of peace and prosperity. It was a dream they called Messiah. But in those days, it would have taken some faith and some imagination just to keep that dream alive. King Herod was on the throne, a wicked and cruel tyrant who was nobody's idea of a Messiah. Roman soldiers tromped through the streets of those cities and villages, taking everything they could get and giving back very little. The old Jewish ways and customs seemed to be disappearing from the land, replaced by the modern ways of the Greeks. People still talked about the Messiah, but they did it with a wink and smile, the way some grown-ups now talk about Santa Claus. Could it be that in such a time and place there was in Mary's mind a room whose door had never been shut or locked. A room called Messiah where she often sat waiting, believing, expecting God to be just as good as His Word. I think it was that kind of faith on Mary's part that caused her to find favor with Him in the first place. Jesus would later say that unless we turn from our present way of living and looking at the world and become like children, we will never enter the kingdom of God. And maybe it was just that kind of thing he was talking about. Maybe he meant that we need to unlock the doors of some rooms that were closed a long time ago, rooms full of faith and imagination. Maybe he meant that we need to stay in touch with such things because he knew that if we are ever going to enter the kingdom, it will be through a door like that. Mary, I think, was in touch with the kinds of things that fill such rooms. She seemed to understand that what we can see and taste and smell and handle is less than a handful of all that really is. So when a messenger came to her and told her that she was going to have a son who would be great and sit on the throne of his ancestor David and rule over the house of Jacob to her credit, she didn't say, what? But only, how? How can this be since I am a virgin? The messenger told her that this child would be conceived in a miraculous way. Holiness made human. Word made flesh. For with God, he concluded, nothing will be impossible. And again, instead of saying, I don't believe it, Mary said, let it be. It was her faith, I think, that caused her to find favor with God. And Luke must have thought so too. Later in this chapter, he recalls the words of Mary's cousin Elizabeth, who said to her, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. New Testament scholar Raymond Brown suggests that Mary, because of her belief, became in that moment the first disciple. That when she said to Gabriel, let it be done to me according to your word, she was opening a door through which countless other disciples would enter, through which you and I are invited to enter also. But it's not easy for us. It's not even as easy for me as it used to be. Sometimes a woman will sit in my study who tells me that her marriage is falling to pieces. And I want to tell her that things are going to be different. I, I, I want to tell her to believe that tomorrow after work, her husband will come to her with a heartfelt apology and an armful of long-stemmed roses. But as I look on her face, I can see that that's not very likely. Or someone will talk to me over a cup of coffee, someone who has been out of a job for six months now and who has been looking every day since, who is ready at this point to take anything, anything, as long as he can have some work. And I want to tell him that at that very moment, someone is looking over his application who is about to pick up the phone and call him and offer him the best job he's ever had in his life. 
But one glance at the front page of the newspaper tells me that's not likely either. Sometimes I get a call, as I did last night, from someone telling me that a member of the church who has been fighting a long, courageous battle with cancer has finally lost. And sometimes people want to know, why did that happen? Where was God in that struggle? Why couldn't this story have a different ending? Those kinds of things can chip away at your faith, make you think there is no such thing as miracles. They can make you want to close that door and lock it and throw away the key. But it hasn't always been that way. There was a time when we looked at the world through eyes that were wide with wonder, when our hearts were full of faith and imagination, when the doors of every interior room stood wide open and it seemed that anything, anything was possible. At this season of the year, we come closer to that state of childlike wonder than in any other season. In spite of those shut doors, the miracle of Christ's coming begins to shine through. And in our most hopeful moments, we can begin to believe again that God really does love us, that He wants to be with us, and that He will do whatever it takes to make it so. Suddenly, there we are, standing up in a room like this one with a congregation of other believers singing at the top of our lungs something like, Go tell it on the mountain, something we've been singing since we were children. And it takes us back, back to those days when nothing was impossible. In that moment, we feel the weight of the world sliding off our shoulders. We feel the door of our heart suddenly swing open, and we feel our spirits soaring, lifting inside of us, taking flight. We begin to believe again like we did in the old days. Anything could happen. Congratulations, Gabriel says. And we answer, what? Why? Because you never stopped believing, he says. You kept the door of your faith propped open, maybe just a crack, but enough for a miracle to get in so that now you too, like Mary, may find yourself favored. And in the days ahead, you may discover that with a little bit of that kind of faith, anything, anything can happen, and nothing will be impossible. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, it's been too long since we were little children since our eyes were bright with wonder, and since we believed that anything could happen. But on this day, move through this room by the power of your presence and spirit. Remind us that even now, things can happen that we could not have anticipated. That you can enter into our lives and be born in us in such a way that all the old brokenness of our lives might be replaced with something shiny and new that you could do for us what no one else has ever been able to do. You could make of us new people, able to look at the world through new eyes. Lord, we ask that it might be so. And on this day so full of hope and promise, we pray that you will come to us and abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. It is in your name that we pray and for our sakes. Amen.